Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in that precious, wonderful, and glorious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, as we look to you today, our hearts are heavy when we consider all of the heartache and all of the struggles and all of the things that are going on in this world. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for those who are over us. We pray that you would bless our president. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with those who protect us. We ask for our police force. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are hurting because of the death of one who was really sadly murdered. Father God, we pray that you would just be with that family and that George Floyd's family would know that indeed our entire country is concerned and, and we want to extend our love and concern for them. But on the other hand, Father, we pray for those who are suffering because of the loss of their businesses and other things that are going on. Oh God, we pray that you would intervene in our nation. And Lord, we pray that you would come forth for us. We need your help. We need your touch. We need your direction. And oh God, we pray for that. We pray for all who share your word, that they might share it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray for all of those who are suffering because of COVID-19. Lord, we should not lose sight of this fact that many are through going, a, going through a difficult struggle and time. And Lord, we ask this morning for your anointing upon this man as I preach your word, that it might be in the power of the Holy Spirit and will give you praise and glory and honor in the precious name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to talk to you today about the second coming of Christ. There's so many things going on around us, it makes me think that the coming of the Lord Jesus might be nearer than we thought. My sermon title is The Great Escape, because that's the part of the second coming I want to talk about. When believers are taken from this earth and they go to be with the Lord Jesus. I want to focus on that today. And our scripture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. A new young pastor had just begun his sermon. He was a somewhat nervous young man, and after a short time into his sermon, his mind went totally blank. He remembered that they had taught him in seminary that when you're in a situation like this, you should just repeat the last point. So he decided to give it a try, and he said, Behold, I come quickly. And then he still had a blank mind. He thought, Well, I'll try it once more. And he said, behold, I come quickly. Still nothing. And he tried one more time with such force. Behold, I come quickly. Then he knocked over the pulpit. He tripped over the flowers in front of the pulpit. And falling into the lap of a little old lady on the front row, there he was. The young pastor apologized and tried to explain what had happened. And the little old lady said, well, that's all right, young man. It was my fault. I should have gotten out of the way. You told me three times that you were coming quickly. Both in the Old and New Testaments, there are references to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in these few verses before us, we have more details about the Lord's coming than in many other scriptures about his coming. In the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are two interesting passages in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 through 44, 
Jesus speaks of his return and he talks about coming as a thief in the night and taking one person and leaving another behind. Then in verse 30, Matthew 24, Jesus speaks of everyone on the earth seeing the Son of Man himself coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So it seems that there, seems, there is a contradiction here. Now, my view is that both of these passages have to be considered when teaching about the Lord's return. Both Peter and Paul taught that the Lord would come as a thief in the night. But John wrote in the book of the Revelation, in Revelation 1-7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And this same thought is found in various passages of the Old Testament. One explanation of this is that the semi second coming of Christ is in two phases. His return is in two parts. And the first is called the rapture, and the second is called the revelation of Christ. Now, I believe that before Jesus comes to this earth to live and reign, he first comes for his church to take them away to be with him. Those who are born again, those who are washed in his blood, those who have believed upon him will be leaving to go and be with him. He's coming for his church. And this is commonly called the rapture. And that's what we have before us in 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, according to the Bible scholar John Valverde, the term rapture itself is derived from the Latin Vulgate version of 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where the expression caught up is translated in the Latin rapturo. And according to the scripture, the saints living at the time of the Lord's coming will be translated or will be taken up to meet the Lord in the air. And it's going to be a glorious time of reunion with our loved ones who have known the Lord, who have gone before. And best of all, as John proclaimed, they shall see his face. Revelation 22, 4. No wonder that Paul described the Lord's coming as the blessed hope in Titus 2, 13. The rapture of the church will be the, one of the most startling events to happen in all of human history. Millions will disappear in the twinkling of an eye and great confusion and bewilderment will occupy the minds of those who are left behind. In the history of preaching, the second coming has not always been given a place of prominence. Although it has a rather significant place in the word of God, there are 260 chapters in the New Testament and over 300 references to this event in the New Testament, and because of the varying views in regard to the Lord's return, some pastors, sadly, won't even mention it because there's different views about it. I trust that God will help me share this wonderful truth of the Lord's coming with you. Now, for our study of this passage of Scripture, we're going to consider, first of all, the glorious promise of His coming, and then the great escape, and then the glad reunion. Sorrow at the death of a loved one is instinctive. And we notice here in verses 13 and 14, but I do, want, not want to, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. You see, it's no by no means forbidden in Scripture that we can't weep. Jesus himself wept at the grave of Lazarus, and the friends of Stephen made great lamentation at his passing. True Christianity does not destroy, but restrains and serves as a moderator over all of our affections. Paul is stating that there is a difference between the sorrow of the unbeliever and the believer at the passing of those who are believers. Note the words, we sorrow not as those who have no hope. In other words, our sorrow is tempered by knowing that we will see our loved ones and our friends who have departed this life if they have received, if they have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
Death for those who do not believe is doubly painful. To them all is over. However, some try to latch onto hope and even say, I know that they are in a better place. But without having received Christ as one's Savior, they will not be in a better place. The better place is heaven, and only those who know the Lord Jesus are going to heaven. Just because someone died doesn't guarantee they're going to be in a better place. Friend, they have to know Jesus to be in a better place. And if they don't, they're going to be in a worse place. For the Christian, death is but the gateway into the very presence of God. Christians are inspired, and they're comforted by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we may mourn for ourselves and, and our sense of personal loss when our loved ones leave, but we don't need to mourn over those who have died in Christ. Roy Castle, the entertainer and also a devout believer, died. And his widow was able to say to her friends, no flowers, no fuss, no mourning, just a whole lot of joy as far as I'm concerned. For Roy is safe in the arms of Jesus. Paul uses some words that have become confusing to some. And wrong doctrine has been derived from those words. In verse 15, verse 15 he speaks of those who have fallen asleep. And in verse 14, he speaks of those who sleep in Jesus. Now, from these two phrases, there are those who teach that when people die, the soul sleeps until the resurrection of the dead, which is spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. However, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared this for us, this very thing, is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul views the body as a tent which is taken down at death. And then he speaks of being absent from the body and present with the Lord. In my view, man is a tripartite being. He is body, soul, and spirit. And when one dies, the body is placed in the ground or disposed of. But the soul and the spirit are absent from that body because of death. Now, you might wonder why Paul used the terms fallen asleep and sleep in Jesus. These are terms that soften the stark and harsh reality of death. Well, it wouldn't be very nice to say, I heard that your brother kicked the bucket. No, looking at a body in a coffin, people don't say to a loved one something like that. They say, wow, they really have died. If they say anything, they say they look like they are sleeping. Jesus said to the repentant thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And from this passage of scripture, there are those who teach that the soul sleeps until Christ returns. But based on what Jesus said to the thief and what Paul said, this is not so. The only sense in which the dead sleep is that their bodies are laid to rest to await the resurrection. Jesus said to that thief, that today you will be with me in paradise. Notice those words. We sorrow not as those who have no hope. This means that though we may sorrow, we cannot sorrow to the extent people do who have no understanding of what death is all about 
The child of God understands it. And when a believer dies, his soul and his spirit go to be with the Lord. My loved ones who knew Jesus are with the Lord. And I praise the Lord for that. And I will see them one day. That's the promise of God's word. The bottom line is that the soul and the spirit will be reunited with a redeemed body in verse 14. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we read of this in detail about how this mortal will put on immortality. It speaks there of a terrestrial or an earthly body, our present body. Terrestrial is a word that signifies that which is of the earth. Then in that same chapter, it speaks of a celestial body, a heavenly body. Celestial has to do with that which is from heaven. And when the dead in Christ rise, they will receive their celestial body as will those Christians who are living when Christ comes for his church. Now let's talk about the great escape. He says in verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. In 1963, there was a popular American movie called The Great Escape. It was a story about Allied prisoners of war escaping from a German prison camp. Some years ago, I watched a television documentary about a tunnel between East and West Berlin while the walls still divided that city. 59 people escaped through that tunnel to freedom. I also saw a Disney movie about some folks who made a hot air balloon to escape from East Germany while it was still under communism. The story was true, and the people did escape to West Germany. A greater escape than mankind has ever known is going to take place when the Lord Jesus comes for his church. First of all, the bodies of departed saints will be resurrected. And as surely as Jesus died after their resurrection, all those believers who are alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Now, there are those who might say, well, I don't think that you should take these words literally. I ask you, why not? Why cannot God do literally and exactly what he says? There is a pronoun used in this passage, and it underscores my conviction that these verses have to do with a literal appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church. The pronoun is in verse 16, where it says, the Lord himself. It makes it more emphatic, it makes it more real. And we have this same kind of emphasis when Jesus ascended into heaven as recorded in Acts 1, 10, and 11, where we read, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52, we have it this way. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, there are three keys that I would like to emphasize when it comes to this matter of the Lord's return. First of all, it bears the aspect of certainty. He shall so come. It involves a personal manifestation. It says, the Lord himself. Not some representative, the Lord himself. And it is without any great hesitancy He'll come in the twinkling of an eye. Why did I call this the great escape? Because it's going to be leaving a world that is in a total mess. We're going to be gone like that. The immoral filth of our time, the sickening of people and dying, 
of COVID-19 and then with murder, the violence, the molestations, the killings of innocents, and with totally godless and wicked behavior called lifestyles, when in reality they are death styles, it is also the great escape because believers will not be left to go through the tribulation. The last three and a half years of the tribulation, God is going to pour out his wrath on this rebellious and godless earth. And if you think things are bad now, they're going to be worse then. And the reason I believe that Christians will not go through the great tribulation is because of various scriptures that indicate this. In Revelation 5, 9, we read, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, it speaks that we are to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, interestingly, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, there is going to be one called the Antichrist. And some people believe that Christians may go through that first part of the tribulation. And that's not impossible but we will not go through the wrath of God because we are promised not to go through the wrath of God. But this one that's going to come is going to come as the Antichrist. And it's very interesting in Scripture. It gives the idea that he's going to rule over the whole world. Paul writes this passage to comfort believers concerning those who have died and those of us who remain awaiting the coming of the Lord. If we are to go through the Great Tribulation, I don't find that that could be a blessed hope. And I don't find that that would bring much comfort. The concept of the rapture or being taken out of this earth is seen in Enoch who walked with God and was not for God took him. Elijah is another example of this. Lot was delivered from Sodom before God poured out his wrath on that city. Noah and his family were also delivered from the devastation of the flood. Rahab at Jericho was delivered before that doomed city was destroyed. God's deliverance of the church before the tribulation and the pouring out of his wrath upon the earth is in keeping with his character and what he says he has always done. The seven churches of Asia Minor are representative of seven eras of church history. And that is a study in itself. It's really very fascinating. However, the last vestige of true Christianity is the church at Philadelphia. And note what is said of this church in Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial that shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, there is a term that is generally considered to refer to apostasy, a turning or falling away from the earth. Now, the word is derived from a Greek verb, aphistomy, and it's used 15 times in the New Testament with only three references relating to turning away from the truth. In verse 11, uh, in which it is used in this chapter, the word depart is a good translation. In a number of translations, the term is rendered departing. And this would certainly support the concept that the church will depart this earth before God pours out his wrath on this earth. Now, what about this glad reunion? Notice what it says here, and it's so precious as I read these words. It says that, that we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, this is the glad reunion, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And thus, we shall ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. These believers were living in a world such as ours with idolatry, debauchery, immorality, persecution, violence, everywhere they turn. And many believers were undergoing persecution for their faith as some believers are today across this world of ours. They were sorrowing over what they saw all about them just as we are sorrowing now. And some were sorrowing so badly that they were losing hope. When I see what is happening in our world with the spread of atheism, 
false religions, the dissolution of biblical Christianity. I can understand their feelings. I don't know how many times I've had people say to me, I hate to think of the world in which my children or grandchildren will live. And this is exactly, my wife, my wife and I pray, pray every day. This is exactly why we pray every day for our grandchildren by name, because we're concerned for that. Nevertheless, those of us who believe have a blessed hope. And we need to live in light of that hope. We cannot lose hope, friends. We must trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not unto our own understanding. And all our ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path. Those who know the Lord and who are living on earth when Jesus comes will meet the Lord in the air. Satan's stronghold. He's called the prince of the power of the air. Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. No phantom, no proverbial substitute, no vicarious spirit. He is not sending a representative for his church, his bride. He is coming himself to catch us away, to take us to be with himself. And we need to understand that. All those who believe in him, he's coming personally for them. The dead in Christ shall rise, receiving their new bodies, and believers will put on immortality and pass with ease through the air. What a triumph for the Lamb who was slain and for those for whom he was slain, who believed upon and received him as their very own. It will take place regardless of anything that Satan and the councils of hell might try to prevent it. What a promise. We shall always be with the Lord. We shall ever be with the Lord. It is a meeting without parting. It assures us an intimate, unending fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life that we might live forever. It will be the fulfillment of what he prayed for in John 17, 20, Father, uh, where he said, Father, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Let me share a song that was written in 1925. Its rhythm is almost like rap. You have heard of little Moses and the bulrush. You have heard of fearless David and his sling. You have heard the story told of dreaming Joseph and of Jonah and the whale you often sing. There are many, many others in the Bible. I should surely like to meet them all. I do declare but that by and by we will surely meet us. The Lord will let us meet them all at the meeting in the air. Many things are going to be missing in that meeting in the air. There will never be a sermon preached to sinners, for the sinner had refused to heed the call. There will be no mourning over wayward loved ones. There will be no more lonely night of prayer. All the burdens, all our anguish will be gone at the meeting in the air. There the doubters will be missing altogether. All the skeptics will be absent on that day. There will be no more grumblers present to disturb us, and the Achans will be busy far away. There the saints will have his seal upon their foreheads, dressed in clothing none but ransomed ones can wear. All who have the wedding garments will be present at that meeting of the air. There's going to be a meeting in the sweet, sweet by and by. I'm going to meet you, meet you there in that home beyond the sky. Such singing you will hear, never heard by mortal ear, for God's own son will be the leading one at that meeting in the air. Friend, I ask you today, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal savior? Are you ready for the meeting in the air or are you lost without Christ? Are you going to be left here when that takes place? You say, well, I... I can hardly believe that's going to happen. Well, I want to tell you something. There has never failed one word of God's promises. In the Old Testament, his first coming was promised. And there are even references in the Old Testament to his second coming. And the New Testament is full of stuff about his verses about his second coming. And he's never failed. I've been a pastor for a long time. And I've watched God work and I've seen how God fulfills his word. You know, in the scriptures, it told us that Israel was going to be restored as a nation. And centuries went by and Israel wasn't restored as a nation. And people sort of scoffed at the fact that Israel would ever be restored as a nation. But friend, it has been restored as a nation. It was in 1948 when that took place. It's restored. It is a nation. 
there is a nation there. And God has promises to Israel and he has promises to the church and God is going to fulfill everything that he's promised. I love a little course that I learned as a child. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line, all the blessings of his love divine, every promise in the book is mine. I hope that that's true for you. If it isn't, why not bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I want to be ready for your coming. I know things are not what they should be between me and you. And Lord, I just pray, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I want to turn from it. I want to receive you as my Savior. And Christian, will you pray, oh God, make me the person you want me to be. Give me the patience I need at such a time as this. Give me the love that I need at such a time as this. And oh God, keep me praying for all that you want to do for us and for our world and for our country. In Jesus' name, amen.